Hi, uh, I'm Anna Shipman. I'm a technical architect at the Government Digital Service. I'm not a spook. Of course, I would say that. Um, and I don't normally talk about my background at the beginning of talks, but it's relevant to why I'm talking about this to you today. So, um, I used to work in publishing, and I taught myself programming. And like many self-taught programmers, I started with websites, I started with HTML, um, CSS, um, some really terrible JavaScript, uh, like copied from sites on the internet to put a random button on my page. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, my first uh, job as a proper developer, uh, first time I managed to get someone to, to pay me to do this, was um, 2005, and I was working as a back-end developer in Java. And I did that for several years, uh, until I joined GDS in 2012. And my first job at DDS, uh, the first project I worked on, was redirecting URLs. So the first thing we did at the Government Digital Service was launch the gov.uk website. And to do that, when we did that, we switched off a bunch of other websites. And we wanted to make sure that your links to the old websites still worked in the new ones. So if you get an email from, a letter from the council saying go to direct.gov forward slash something, we wanted it to go to the right place on gov.uk. And what we ended up doing was we ended up writing Perl to generate Nginx config. Now, I'd never written Perl before, and I'd never even heard of Nginx, um, but it was pretty cool, uh, and I really enjoyed it. And um, the other thing that, um, that happened when I was on that team was there was an infrastructure team, GovUK infrastructure team, and they, every now and then they'd send out these long emails um, explaining something like uh, they'd you know, optimized the virtual machine that we were using for development, or they'd done some, made some change to CI server. And uh, these, these emails seemed to be written in English, but I didn't understand them at all. And I wanted to understand them. So I persuaded the infrastructure team to let me join them. And my original idea was to join the team for like three months until I got to grips with some of this. Uh, but I ended up spending two years on the team. And it led directly to what I'm doing now, which is um, technical architect on um, a pretty large infrastructure project. So I'm not suggesting that you all go out of this talk and go and join the infrastructure team, but um, what I did learn while I was working on that team made me a better developer. So hopefully I can share some of those things with you today. So as I said in the outline, what I'm going to cover is wrangling servers, virtualization, containerization, and I'm going to finish up with some tools that will hopefully improve your development. Um, each section is going to have like a, a, a take-home message that you can use today, tomorrow. So. Wrangling servers. So when I was writing this, this talk, I got a bit bogged down in detail, and I thought I was going to have to explain like, how the internet works. Um, you might have seen this uh, nonsensical quote that it's a series of tubes. Uh, this is one of those tubes. This is an undersea cable. Um, this is how we get our internet from America or send it to America. Uh, the thing I really like about this picture is that the person holding the undersea cable has a perfect French manicure. Anyway, so I decided that I didn't need to explain the entire internet, but what I want to talk about is, is servers. So to start with, it would be useful for me to know where your, where your servers are. So I'm going to give you five options. I'll go through them, and then I'm going to ask for a show of hands. So uh, maybe you own them, like they're in a cabinet in your office somewhere, or um, you've rented some space in the data center. Maybe you use shared hosting, so that's where you have like FTP access to a shared file, and that's how you deploy your applications. Maybe use the cloud, so AWS or um, Azure or something like that. Um, maybe you use um, a PaaS or some kind of application hosting like Heroku or Google App Engine. Google App Engine. Um, and the last option is something else or you don't know. OK, so who owns their servers? OK, quite a few of you. Uh, who uses shared hosting? A little bit more. Maybe about a fifth of you. Uh, who uses the cloud? Right, OK, cool, most of you. Uh, who uses Paz, Her uh, Heroku? OK, right, so most of you are using the cloud. And who something else doesn't know? OK, right, OK, so most of you are using the cloud. Um, and then share, the rest kind of split equally, shared hosting, um, Paz, and you own them. OK, that's good to know, thank you. So. You need to make sure that where your website is hosted has the software you need to run, to run your site. Um, if you're using shared hosting, you've chosen something that runs the software you need. Um, otherwise, you need to somehow get that software onto it. So you need to make sure it's running Rails, or it's running Ruby, or it's running Node. 
And um, there's the one way you can do this is actually get onto the server and uh, install the software on that server in the same way that you would install it on your local computer. Um, and this is what we call handcrafting servers. Um, and that's, you know, that's the way to bring up a server. It's the way you know how to do it. It's the way you know how to configure your local machine. But what happens if your server dies? What happens if AWS sends you an email and says, we're going to switch off your server in 24 hours? Or something else happens. Remy's making a face. Does this ever happen to you? Um, <laughs> and um, it's, also, it's also easy to make a mistake. Um, you know, like actually typing in the commands, you could, you could type something wrong and accidentally install the wrong software or not install something you need. So the way that um, sort of common industry practice now is to use configuration management. And configuration management is basically where you write the configuration that you want your server to have um, in code somehow. And it depends, uh, different tools do it in a different way, but um, you write the code and then the configuration management tool runs that code for you in an automated way, maybe in a repeated, um, you know, on a timer or whatever. So these are some of the main configuration management tools. Uh, CF Engine was the first. Um, Puppet, uh, Puppet and Chef are quite big. Ansible is newer, and the, the ones at the, at the bottom here are, are very new. Um, just out of interest, on GovUK we use Puppet. Um, the project I'm on at the moment we use Ansible. Um, and I'm not going to do a comparison of the different tools, but um, at the end of the slides, I'm going to put my slides on SlideShare later, and at the end of the slides are loads of links, and there is a comparison of different config management tools. So basically, config management automates building your servers for you, um, which means that it's reliable and it's repeatable. So uh, if your server does die, it's no problem, right? You just run your config management again, and it brings up a new server. It looks exactly the same. Um, I wanted to also give you some getting started guides, but it turns out that some of them are quite um, involved. Um, some of them assume a lot of basic knowledge. So I've included two um, quite straightforward ones, um, and maybe I'll write a blog post later that does simple ones for all the other ones. Um, but basically, uh, you, you should use config management because it just means you can relax, you can not worry about your server going down. And if, if you don't want to use config management, if nothing else, just write a script and then you can run that, and then you don't need to panic. <laughs> Do you feel better already? <laughs> so, um, so basically, there's a concept in infrastructure that I'd never heard before I joined the infrastructure team, and, and everyone in infrastructure talks about it. Your servers should be cattle, not pets. You should, you know, your server shouldn't be like a trusted love friend that, you know, you're, you're really sad when something happens to it. It should just be, you shouldn't really, you know, you don't care whether it dies. You, you just care about the output. You care about how your application is. So try and treat your servers like cattle, not pets. So the take home of this section is you shouldn't be afraid to lose your servers. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is virtualization. So virtualization is, is um, creating logical computing resources from available physical resources. So what I'm talking about here is virtual machines. A uh, virtual machine is basically um, a machine, a computer that's run using software that, to all intents and purposes, to you, looks like a little computer, but, um, but isn't. And it's run on an actual hardware computer. Before I go into a bit more detail, um, I want to address the question of what a hypervisor is, because hypervisor is another term that I'd never heard before I joined the infrastructure team. And then as soon as I was on the team, everyone started banding it around like it was the most common thing in the world. And I was involved in all these conversations where I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So hopefully this will prevent you being in that situation. A uh, hypervisor is a software that runs the virtual machines. So here is a diagram, a beautifully drawn diagram. Um, the host is your computer or a server. The hypervisor is the software that's running the virtual machines. And then inside is each virtual machine. And it's basically um, looks to you like a little computer. It's running a full operating system. It's running your app or other apps. You can run multiple ones. Um, I'll come back to running a virtual machine on your computer in a second. But I just want to take a slight digression into cloud, cloud, cloud. Um, so I, I don't know, you might have seen there's a browser plugin that uh, replaces um, cloud with, with uh, someone else's computers, which is basically, that is what the cloud is. Um, so unless, I mean, actually, as, unless you have a server in your office uh, in a cabinet, um, your servers are in a data center somewhere. 
And um, what, so cloud computing and virtualization are not the same thing, but cloud computing uses virtualization um, to, um, basically, virtualization acts as a layer of abstraction that abstracts away the, the resources, so you don't, I'll, I'll show you a diagram, you don't see the servers, you just see the virtual machines. So between you and the data center is the hypervisor, and you, you, uh, you bring up your virtual machines in you know, the UI or whatever the interface that the cloud provider offers to you, um, and they could be anywhere. These, these are the servers in the data center, your virtual machines could be you know, on different servers, on the same server, they could be in different data centers, you don't know, you don't need to know about that. And the advantages of that, um, the first thing is, the virtual machines running are on the computer, so you don't, you don't care about the hardware, right? The hardware is, is cattle to you, you don't care. Um, and if the data center decides to switch off those servers um, or something, there's some disaster, doesn't matter, like your virtual machine can just get moved to another piece of hardware and there's no, there's no problem for you. So there's increased uptime for you um, and disaster recovery. Um, other advantages of using cloud computing are you can get a virtual machine as soon as you need one. Um, you just go to the UI, you know, click all the buttons and you have one in minutes. Um, you can't do that with a server, you have to order it and wait for it to be delivered and then configure it. Um, and also, you're only charged for what you use. Like, if you stop needing that much capacity, you just stop, you're no longer paying for it, um, and yeah, you don't have to pay more than you need, whereas with a server, you can't just like, send it back for a refund for the unused time. Okay, so that was a little digression into cloud. Now, let's talk about your computer uh, and how virtualization is useful to you. So, um, back like in my last job, maybe five years ago, um, I wouldn't really have used a virtual machine unless I had to. They were really slow, really resource intensive, like uh, you'd only use one at a time, it might crash your computer. Um, you only did it if you really had to. Uh, in 2005, Intel and AMD, who are the main manufacturers of CPUs for personal computers, um, introduced um, hardware accelerated virtualization. So before this, every single um, instruction from a virtual machine had to be um, uh, had to be done in software, had to be replicated in software to imitate the hardware. Um, but then when they introduced hardware accelerated virtualization, it meant that you were giving instructions directly to the hardware, which meant that it was much quicker, um, much less resource intensive, and now you can run like lots of, lots of virtual machines and it's really much more lightweight. So I want to talk about a particular tool that's really good for this, which is Vagrant. So Vagrant uh, is an open source project and it's a, it's a way to create virtual machines and it's very, very straightforward. So last week I was at Velocity and um, there was a workshop uh, and they said for the workshop you need, um, you, need to, you need to have a virtual machine that's running CentOS, at least version 6 I think, and has 2 gigs of RAM. So I just wrote this Vagrant file and that, that was all I needed to do, and then I, and then I had, you know, then I ran Vagrant and I had my virtual machine that I needed for the workshop. The actual, the simplest Vagrant file you could write looks like this. That is just, um, basically just uh, an Ubuntu trusty 64-bit machine. That's just, and that's all you need to do to bring up a virtual machine on your local computer. So then, assuming you've got Vagrant installed, you type Vagrant up, and there's your virtual machine running. Uh, just to give you a few more details if you want to go and get started with this, to get, to get onto the machine you do Vagrant SSH and then you move to the slash Vagrant directory and then that is the, is the mounted directory of the files on your computer. So you can then um, install the software you need on that Vagrant <coughs> machine, you can run tests. If you've got a web server, you can bring up a browser and you can point at that virtual machine uh, as if it was remote but it's on your computer, which is quite handy for um, train journeys and that kind of thing. Um, the Vagrant documentation is very, very good, so there are links to that at the end. Um, so the advantage of using a virtual machine like this is you can develop locally using the same software you're using remotely. So you're not writing code on your Mac um, and then deploying it to a Linux server somewhere and it might work differently. Like Remy yesterday was talking about um, if it's uh, case sensitive, it's case sensitive, it's not case sensitive on your Mac, but it is on the Linux server, you get problems that you didn't anticipate. You don't have that because you're testing it on your virtual machine, which is running Linux. It's using the same software dependencies. Um, and uh, you can use configuration management to build your virtual machine. If you were sold on my previous section, um, 
you can use the same config. If you own your own, if you're managing your own servers, so basically anyone who's not using shared hosting, if you own them, if you're, if you're using the cloud, um, you can uh, use the same configuration management that you use to configure your remote servers to configure your local virtual machines. So then you're running your programs against the exact same software that you're going to be using in production. And the, thing, the reason I really like Vagrant is because it makes it really easy to collaborate. Um, if you have an open source project and you want other people to get involved, instead of having like um, a sort of step by step, this is what you should need to. This is how you need to set up your development environment. You just write a Vagrant file and then you say, here's how you get started. You type Vagrant up, and then they've got the exact environment that they need to develop on your project, and it's much easier to get started. And related to that, for my own personal projects, I really like it because. If I, you know, I work on something and then I put it aside for a couple of months, and when I come back, everything's exactly as it needs to be. I don't need to make any changes to my computer to get back started again. I just bring up the virtual machine and carry on where I left off. Um, Vagrant is made by a company called HashiCore, who are really awesome. They do a lot of really good open source uh, stuff. I just want to briefly mention um, something that was launched last month, which is called Otto. Um, eventually, Otto will probably replace Vagrant, but at the moment, Otto just calls out to Vagrant. So you don't need to worry about Otto for now. Um, Vagrant is still like the way to go with this and will be for a little while. Um, and my take home from this section is Vagrant can improve your project tomorrow. Okay. Next thing I'd like to talk about is containerization. So um, you've probably heard of Docker. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Docker is not the only containerization, containerization technology available, but it's you know it's the big it's the big news right now. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, Docker is based on Linux containers. Uh, the technology that Docker is based on is not new. So uh, Linux containers have been in Linux distribution since 2008. Um, there's also in other Unix distribution, there's Solaris Zones and BSD Jails. And they're all based on Shroot, which has been in Unix since 1982. So the technology is not new, but what Docker's done is like made it much more usable, much more user-friendly, added some features, some security features that make it easier to use this containerization technology. So I'll explain what a container is. Uh, so here again is your computer. And you're running an operating system on your computer, and it's Linux. Docker only works on Linux at the moment. Uh, and Linux is running, Docker is running uh, the, a container engine. And inside, the, um, inside the, the container engine is running containers, maybe one or more containers. And they have maybe your app. Maybe this one has MySQL. Maybe you're connecting to other apps. Um, and if, just as a refresher on, the, on uh, virtualization versus containerization. So uh, in virtualization, the hypervisor is running like lots of little computers, and each computer is running a full operating system. So it's more, there's more going on there. Uh, containerization is much more lightweight. You're, you're running one operating system, and that operating system is running containers. And you can run multiple containers. And the containers are basically like a, a section of your computer, um, where if you're in one container, you don't have permission to access another container. And they're isolated from each other. Um, so why would you use them? So configuring a virtual machine, um, in the way I said, uh, it can be kind of slow. Like bringing up a Vagrant file, it doesn't take very long, it takes about a minute. Um, that's kind of, you know, that's time you have to wait. If you, if you need a lot of really complicated configuration, it can start to take quite a long time. And so you might think at that stage, instead of every time you bring up a virtual machine, like installing this, installing that, making these configuration changes and it taking a while, you might instead want to just take a snapshot of what it looks like when all that's done, uh, when the dependencies are all exactly the same um, as you know, the point that you've got to when you're finished with your configuration management. And then that container is what you deploy to production. So that means you're, um, you've actually, what you're testing against locally is, um, is, the, is the actual dependencies at the point at which you got to at the end of your configuration management. So um, containers are immutable, right? So it's just a snapshot of what it looked like at that point. Um, and because it's what you deploy to production, you can be sure that what you've tested uh, is exactly what's in production. So I said with um, configuration management, you're testing against the same versions of the software. 
but you are reinstalling them. Like something could change in that time, um, uh, or if you've like not specified the version, something could change. But with containerization, you are, it's exactly it's exactly the snapshot that you are testing against is the snapshot that you deploy to production, and it's got all the same dependencies. So there are a few. Um, things that make developing, developing with Docker a bit harder than using uh, virtual machines running with configuration management. Um, that immutability, um, it can make developing locally kind of difficult. It's not, uh, it's not how you're used to developing. You can't run Docker containers everywhere. Um, not, all, uh, not all infrastructure providers support Docker yet, so um, you know, it's not necessarily something that everyone is free to use right now. Um, and it's maybe a harder concept to grasp. It's slightly, like with virtual machines, it's like a little computer, it looks like a little computer. With the containerization, it's like a section of your computer that you don't have access to other things, but it's, it can be harder to grasp. So my take home from this section, specifically because Remy asked me this question, is um, it's not essential to get to grips with Docker right now. Like I wouldn't necessarily give up your weekend to make sure you understand Docker. Um, unless you're interested, in which case, by all means, dig into it, because I think it's going to continue to be big. But, I mean, you can wait a bit until it's more user-friendly, more easy, more obvious. Does that answer your question? Good, right. Okay. I just want to um, take a slight digression into um, virtualization plus containerization together. So if you're developing locally, probably um, you're using Vagrant for virtualization and Docker for containerization. But if you deploy to the cloud, so remember what I said about the cloud is using a hypervisor. If you deploy to the cloud, this is what's happening. You've got a host running a hypervisor, which is running a virtual machine, which is running an operating system, running Linux, which is running a container engine, which is running a app. So if something goes wrong, how do you know where the problem is? It's turtles all the way down. So this is probably fine. But um, just be aware of that. Some, uh, some vendors deploy containers directly on hardware, and that's probably the right way to run containers. Um, but this was worth bearing in mind. OK, good. That was fun. So I'm going to um, refresh on what we've covered so far, um, because uh, this stuff that I've just been talking about is stuff that I learned while I was on the infrastructure team. Uh, the rest of what I want to tell you about is stuff that's not really infrastructure related. It's stuff I just picked up while I was on that team that helped. So what we've covered, um, wrangling servers, basically you should see your servers as cattle, not pets. Virtualization, you should use Vagrant. Containerization, you don't need to get stuck into Docker right now unless you are interested. And now, um, I'm going to talk about some things that I learned while I was on the team that aren't directly infrastructure related. So some tools to make you a better developer. So Remy asked me, should all my tools be written in JavaScript? And warned me that if the answer was no, there might be a revolution. So prepare yourselves. Um, I was going to talk about build systems, task runners. Um, so there's Grunt, there's Gulp. I think there's one called Broccoli and Brunch. Yes, OK. So these are, these are task runners. These help you build your projects. Um, and, but they don't just work out of the box, right? They need, you need to install dependencies. Um, you, need to make sure, you might need to make sure you've got the right plugins. Uh, I've got a link at the end uh, which suggests that you could instead use NPM. Right, it's not my idea. <laughs> But uh, I'm going to suggest instead that you use something called Make. Good. <laughs> Excellent. So Make, uh, make is a Unix tool. Uh, it's been in uh, Unix distributions for about 20 years. Um, and using Make, you can create tasks to do anything, uh, to compile, to run, to build, to do lots of crazy things if you want to. Um, I'll tell you a couple of advantages of Make, and then I'll go through a Make file. Um, so it's really good at dependency tracking and resolution, and it only, does what, it only does what it needs to do. So this is an example make file. And what this is doing, so let's look at this one. Uh, this is running, um, it's, it's transforming your styles.scss into CSS. And this is basically what Grunt and Gulp, et cetera, are doing. They're just JavaScript wrappers around the tasks you need to run. Um, 
So the way you'd call this task is you'd say make styles.css, and that would generate your CSS file. And this will only run if uh, styles.css is newer than styles.css. Sorry, did I say that right? If styles.scss is newer than styles.css. Like if it's generated styles.css more recently than you've made changes to your scss, then it won't bother running it again. Um, here's the other task, print.css, uh, and that generates uh, your print.css file. And then this first one is um, all, and that runs uh, the two tasks, style.css and print.css. Um, because make defaults to running the first task uh, in your make file, if you've ordered your make file like this, you can just type make, and that will make all your CSS files. And in the same way, I said it, it doesn't do what it doesn't need to do. If you had already run print.css, then running make or make all wouldn't run print.css again. So it basically, it only does what it needs to do. It doesn't, it doesn't waste time rebuilding stuff that doesn't need rebuilding. So those are, the, those are some advantages. Um, another one is it's included in your operating system. If you're using Linux, uh, other Unix variations, if you're using Mac OS, then it's already included. Uh, if you're using Windows, you can install it. So basically, it has everything you need. It's just not written in Java. So hopefully that's, um, that's maybe like opened you to the idea of using some other Unix tools. So I'm going to talk about some other Unix tools. There are loads. Uh, some examples are grep. Grep is um, for searching. Um, cat, which isn't for producing a cat. Uh, it's to concatenate and print files. Um, and awk, which uh, scans input files for patterns um, and optionally does something. So uh, print the second column in this CSV, for example. And the most useful is man, which is display the manual pages. So if you type man grep, you get instructions on how to use grep. If you type man man, you get instructions on how to use man. OK, so Unix tools, uh, there's this idea of being Unix-y. Um, each tool does one thing very well. Uh, it does it very fast, but it just does one thing. Uh, and then the tools are composable. So you compose tools um, by using the pipe. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example. So this is from a paper by Donald Knuth, who wrote a paper about literal programming. And the program uh, that he wrote in something like 10 pages of Pascal was um, to read a file of text, determine the end most frequently used words, and print out a sorted list of those words along with their frequencies. So just think for a moment about how you would do that. OK, in your favorite programming language. OK, so in Unix, you can do that in six lines. And I'll go through that. So the first tool we're using is translate. And what translate does is it translates the first thing you pass it into the second thing. So um, the dash C means complement, so we're translating the opposite of the alphabetical characters into a new line, and um, the S is squash. So what we've done is we've uh, translated everything that's not an alphabetical character into a new line and removed duplicate new lines, so like spaces. So what we end up with after this line is one word per line. Then we, oops, that was the pipe. That's how you compose the tools. You pipe the output of that into the next line, which uh, translate again, you translate all uppercase characters to lowercase characters. The end use sort, which um, is, uh, as, it, as it describes, that sorts the words. You then use unique, and unique removes all duplicates. The dash C flag um, gives you a count of how many duplicates there were before you removed them. You then sort again, and the flags here are reverse numerical. So now you've sorted into a descending, uh, uh, the words into descending numerical order. And the last one is a stream editor. So it was, remember, the program was read the n most frequently, um, determine the n most frequently used words. So that's n. You pass in n on the command line, and at q, it quits after it's printed out that many. OK, that was to do that. So it, you can do pretty complex things by um, composing these tools that only just do one thing at a time. So you might not want to suddenly start writing all your programs in Unix, but if you have you know, complex tasks that need to be done quickly, you can, just, you can just use Unix tools. And it's worth getting familiar with, with Unix tools locally, because 
So you might find yourself in a situation where you suddenly are on a server trying to debug, and the only things that are available to you on that server are Unix tools. Uh, and if you've never used them locally, then it's, it's a bit, you know, you don't know what to do. It might make you panic a bit. Um, so it's worth trying to, you know, just use them for simple tasks locally. Uh, here's an example. Um, if you use rake, uh, then rake-t prints out all the tasks in rake. Um, and you might be looking for a task and you can't remember what it's called or you, you know some detail about it. So you do rake-t and you pipe that to grep and you put in some detail. And the output of this command will be all the rake tasks that um, contain the word some detail. So the other thing I want to talk about with Unix tools um, is, is reading the output. Uh, they're, very, they're very well documented in the man pages and also they give you hints while you're using them. So I'll give an example from, from Git, which is a distributed version control system that many of us might be using. Uh, so in Git, you might, um, you might accidentally uh, stage a file for committing that you, that you didn't mean to. So um, you get to this situation, you do git status, and you see that git wants to commit this file, and you don't want to. So you're like, oh no, what do I do? What do I do? And the answer to what you do is actually already written there. It tells you, use git reset head to unstage it. And the reason I mention this, it might seem kind of obvious, but the reason I mention this is because I don't tend to necessarily read the output. I just see the error and go, well, no, I don't know what to do. And with these, with these tools, like, it's probably written there what you should do. So it's worth paying attention to that. Um, I'll give you an exa another example of error messages. So here, I want to search for all um, occurrences of the word Anna uh, in the current directory I'm in. Um, and I want to search recursively. I want to search in the directory I'm in and all the subdirectories. Um, so that's what I type. But I have forgotten to tell grep where to look. I have just, I'm just, it, so it tells me that I'm trying to recursively search standard in because I haven't given it an input file. So what I wanted to do was put dot, which means current working directory. Okay? So basically, like, the tools will, will give you the clues to work out how to use them correctly. So my take home from this section is that Unix tools can help you. Uh, and so we have reached the end early. Um, and so I'm just going to tell you what the main three things that I would like you to take home from this talk. Use Vagrant. Unix tools are your friends. Read the output. Thank you.